So you were right there, right next we door. We were next door to the patronage office, but you never saw it. You had no idea. The pat there was an ante room, you know, a, a reception room. There was a, a woman who sat at the desk there, a receptionist, and there were some chairs. And that's all you ever saw. You walked in there, you handed your letter to her. She went, she opened the door, went in the back to an area you couldn't see. And then she came back out and said, fine. Or she came out and said, here, you go get your fingerprints. Because they, fin they printed everybody. And, you know, that was the patronage office. But behind those doors, there were all these ladies processing all this paper for all these folks bringing in letters. Letters to get hired, letters to get promoted, mm -hmm. you know. You, you had to have, in those days, you had to have a letter. letter. Well, you know, unless you were police, fire, or uh, you took, and there were a few jobs covered by the civil, true civil service with right. an exam. Everybody else had to have a letter. Well, the old phrase, don't send nobody who nobody sent. Nobody sat. knows, right. That, that this is right. an example right. of that. So were those ladies actually making the decision themselves? Oh, heavens no. No. So how did, how did they get their orders? They're processing They're just paper processing paper. To just, to just complete the files. Right. So that then the right. patronage office would right. report, yes, it's, right. it's now complete. It's complete. Yes. So, so let me circle back. Um, now, your, go ahead. I'm sure they have long since shredded all those files. <laughs> right. <laughs> now, you, you, you have a degree in history. Right. Um, along the way, you learned budgetary skills. And presumably at the point when uh, the city did its uh, desk audit of you, they, they, they sensed that you had those skills. Yeah. Now, how did you develop those skills? Well, you, you know, budgeting is not high finance. Budgeting is, you know, I always tell people, look, this ain't rocket science. You got so much money, you've got something which is revenue or income, and you got so much expense. Mm -hmm. All you got to do is add up all the expense, add up all the revenue. If they, they're equal, you're in good shape. If you got more <laughs> revenue than expense, you're in great shape. If you got less revenue than expense, you got a problem. You got to figure out either how to get more revenue or how to cut the expense, you know. And I, I learned just how to do the stuff now that at would, Model Cities. At Model Cities was when, yeah. when you learned how to yeah, do the, the the operational side of all yeah, that. Yeah, because, I mean, that's that was a lot of what we did. The people would make application to get these grant funds, and we would go through the budget. And I, I also learned that, I guess one of, one of the things that I learned in that Model Cities experience was to ignore all the fluff people wrote about, you know, because they would, you know, write all of, you know, they were going to save the world and, you know, <laughs> redeem mankind. And I, it didn't take me long to figure out, never mind all this that they're writing. You go back to that budget. How many of what kinds of people do they have? Right. And, and, you know, can this number of people get this done? And how much are they trying to pay these people? And are they, you know, wasting money on rent and a whole bunch of other overhead nonsense? Right. So now you're in the city's budget now office. Now I'm in the city budget office as a federal grant coordinator. My job was to look at all of this federal grant money that was pouring in, see what the departments, because ultimately it got out to the departments, what were they doing with it? Were they following the federal guidelines? And, you know, my Bible, unlike the rest of the folks, their Bible was the appropriation ordinance. Mine was 
the Code of Federal Domestic Assistance, or the Catalog of Federal Domestic Assistance, mm -hmm. because the other thing I did was look for more money, mm -hmm. categorical grant funds, because the departments, there would be federal money sitting out there. They did not want to be bothered. They didn't want to put together the application. They didn't want to be bothered with running the programs. They were going to have to hire people they didn't know. They were going to have to follow rules and regulations. Lord knows that they didn't want to be bothered with. So they just wouldn't even apply for the money. You know? Right. So it was my job to, to find what was available and then go to these departments and like, why aren't you applying for this? And the other thing you had to do was there would be aggressive departments who on some really spurious and tangential uh, rationale would go and apply for money that they should not have applied for. But right. they would say, oh, why don't we go and apply for health care money because even though we're in charge of senior citizens, some of them are sick. Right. You know? <laughs> so they're stepping on the toes of other programs. Yeah. Right. And, and getting money to manage that they're not going to have a clue of really how to manage it. Right. You know, and, and you had a lot of that going on. You'd have the more entrepreneurial and aggressive departments. Now, how, what, what was your next job after monitoring the, supervising the federal grants? Uh, I was made it, well, I always did that. In you the always did that. Yeah, right. I was ultimately promoted to assistant budget director. Uh, and Ed Bedore is still the budget director? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. He's still a budget director. Then Daly the Elder dies, and I'm, I'm still in the budget office. Uh, Blandick gets installed. And Belandic was fired Jane Byrne and appointed me to head the Department of what was then Consumer Sales Weights and Measures. Uh, and I became the head of that department. So that's the one that Jane Byrne uh, had been in and she, she talked when she ran for uh, mayor about how she had been in the mayor's cabinet. So this is, this is that department yeah, head. Yeah position that she held right. for a period of time. Right, and that was a period in time when consumerism was the big thing. You right. know, it's a Now how did you happen to get tapped for, for that job? Well, I'm sure Ed Bador pushed it. Right. The mayor was Belandic now. Now, 11th Ward again. Right. Previously, Belandic had been the chair of the Finance Committee, if you will remember. He took over from Tom Keene when Tom Keene had to go away on his federal vacation. So uh, I knew Belandic, and Belandic knew me because the Budget Office, of course, worked closely with the Finance Committee, and what's more, Belandic had sort of a, uh, an, an office that he used when he was finance chair up it, sort of in the back of the budget office. So he was around. Mm -hmm. So he kind of knew me. Now, did you notice any changes between the Daly administration and the Belandic administration in the way any of the things you described no. operated day to day? No. no. So now, what, what was it like being a department head working for the mayor? How often did you get to see the mayor? What was he like? All right. Remember, I'm a, a department head under Belandic. Belandic, right. Not under Daly. Correct. Correct. Uh, uh, you rarely saw Belandic, or I didn't. But remember, I had a real small department. Mm-hmm. That may have been big in the eyes of sort of the national media, all this Bess Meyerson and consumerism and yada, yada, yada. That didn't mean it was important in the eyes of the city. 
uh, in my major goals in life were to make sure there was not yet another taxicab scandal, to try and make sure, insofar as I could, that all these inspectors I had out there were actually working maybe six of the eight hours a day, you know. Right, so they didn't wind up on the front page of the Tribune. Right. That, that, right. that was my, my goal in life, was not to be on the front page of the trip. And so how long did you do that? The rest of the Balandic administration? Yeah. I did that the rest of the Balandic administration. So what was that? About 18, it wasn't a full two years. Till 1979, 79, April right. of 1979. Yes. yes. First thing Jane Byrne did was fire me. Because you were her successor yes. and appointed by her, right. by right. the late mayor's successor. Yep. So, so now, you you head out of town. Do I have the chronology right? right? Yep. Yep. I couldn't. I, you know, I couldn't find a job in Chicago. Clearly, I wasn't going to be working in in anybody's government. I mean, that that was out, and I couldn't find a job in the in the private sector. You know, what skills did I have for the private sector at the time? Uh, so, and I, I was just, you know, another case of happenstance. A guy from ICMA, uh, International City Managers Association, was coming through Chicago, sitting in O'Hare, read about me in the newspaper. And looked you up. Recruited and me. So what, what was the job you had in D.C.? I went there as an assistant budget director in the first Barry administration, Marion Barry. Marion Barry. So um, we, we just have five more minutes on this tape, but why, why don't you describe the, the contrasts in that administration in Washington versus what we've heard about in Chicago. And obviously this is part one of, of what will be continued on a second tape. Okay. Uh, well, I got out there and I, I used to refer to the D.C. government, they, they wouldn't be happy to hear this, as the pretend government. You know, they were pretending to run the city. Uh, and th they were so full of themselves, they were just so proud to be, you know, in, they thought, in charge of the city. But every law they passed, everything, every, little Mickey Mouse laws, like, you know, the installation of a stoplight, right. had to go up and lay over on, in Congress. It went to the district committee. And, you know, it, it, it became law only if they did not uh, object. Object to it. it. You know, it was bizarre to me. You know, a local Chicago alderman, not even a leader among the aldermen, some one of the, you know, real, totally, you know, inept aldermen, has more power <laughs> than the mayor over of. zoning and all kinds of other stuff than the mayor out here. These people are crazy. <laughs> so, so what years were you in D.C.? I was there uh, from 79 to 83. 79 to 83, and 83 is no coincidence that's a mayoral election year. Right, I got recruited back. Now, why don't we why don't we just end this at this okay. point because we wouldn't want to interrupt the next phase. Okay. So this is part one. Thank you. Part one. <laughs> Thank you.